Hello and welcome to lecture number three on ancient China and Japan. Uh, Chinese civilization developed along the Yellow and Yangtze rivers around 5000 BCE. So we're talking about a time period here that's way back there with the Mesopotamians and the ancient ancient Egyptians. And uh, I chose this map here because it shows us on the dotted line the current borders of China, the country. And uh, within that, it shows the Yellow River and the Yangtze River where uh, everything started developing around. So again, we see a major civilization starting out based around river valleys where agriculture could lead to major cities. Uh, we start in China because it, it started the earliest in China, and China's civilization and culture went on to have major, major 95% influence on the makeup of the civilization and culture of the countries around it, including Japan, Korea, Vietnam, um, major, major cultures like that, which have their own voice and identity, owe a lot of homage to the things that were developed in China. Today, we're going to be predominantly talking about China and then also a little bit about Japan. Some inventions of the ancient Chinese, uh, paper and paper making, as well as movable print typing, gunpowder for fireworks and for warfare, Kites, if you invent paper, you have a really good shot at being the first to invent kites. Uh, and porcelain. Porcelain is a handcrafted ceramic that uh, is one of the things that gives us the most detailed art artifacts from the time periods of the very early uh, Chinese civilization. But from the very beginning, we see a repeating pattern with our other early civilizations. Uh, starting out, homes of average citizens were built from adobe and rough stone and uh, rough-hewn wood, often with thatched roofs, as we see in this little village model here. Um, many would have had a pit area or an underground level, just like other civilizations. And over time, adobe was replaced with wooden panels and thatch with glazed tiles. Um, so here we see an early building that's built out of very large adobe blocks, I believe. Um, but already we can see the tile construction here. So from early on, uh, predominant use of clay led the Chinese civilization to develop uh, ceramic roof tiles and uh, pottery that was very complex, as well as the porcelain that we're talking about before. Here is an assortment of Chinese homes at the lower class level or the early level, uh, usually we see as technological developments come through, they benefit the upper class people first and then become passed on as civilization as a whole moves toward a new way of doing things. So here we can see adobe and stucco. We can see a stone, rough stone wall down here in the, in the top right picture. There's a rough stone river rock wall. And here again, we can see a little bit more development of those techniques into uh, being refined. So on the right hand picture, you can see the building on the left is stone blocks, rough hewn stone blocks. And the building on the right uh, is made out of wooden panels and timber work. One of the key defining characteristics of early and ancient Chinese civilization is their early interest in woodworking. Throughout what we're going to be studying about China today, we're going to see a evolution of woodworking across thousands of years that uh, was refined repeatedly and repeatedly so that their their dedication to working with wood over stone and other materials, despite the fact that their region has a lot of earthquakes and it has a huge variety of weather events, um, it's very cold, it gets very wet, uh, led them to refine their woodworking techniques far beyond what we see of civilizations happening around the world at a similar time. But bear in mind that these techniques were developed over a thousand years, and uh, we see iterations of almost every possible variation, uh, especially across the economic spectrum. Here is a pottery representation of a, a family home, and much like the other civilizations who, from each of them, we have seen examples of models of their dwelling places. This, again, is an ancient structure that is indicative of major characteristics. So what we see around the bottom is a wall, and that's going to be major, one of the major features of Chinese architecture. Uh, also glazed tiles for the roof, uh, multiple roof structures, and tiered 
uh, layer cake style buildings. So you see how those same keywords could be used for Mesopotamian or Incan perhaps, but the visual differences here are quite striking and I think anyone would recognize these as uh, characteristically Chinese. Moving beyond the simple, uh, one of the grandest representations of Chinese civilization, especially in architecture, lies in the Forbidden City, which was a, a vast and opulent palace complex of about 980 buildings. Uh, forbidden referred to the fact that no one could enter or leave the palace without the emperor's permission. Today, this area is estimated to be worth over $70 billion, making it the most valuable real estate in the world. Here's another building within the Forbidden City. So you can see that at the higher class level for emperors and for priests, the development of complexity and detail and quality of craftsmanship was completely unparalleled within this uh, architectural practice. Here's another image of the Forbidden City. Uh, and you can see here right away something that is found throughout Chinese architectural practice, and that's symmetry. If you look closely, you can see that, by and large, the left hand and the right hand are laid out very similarly. And so symmetry is gonna be our first keyword. Uh, not just in the buildings, here's another building of the Forbidden City, um, not just in the buildings, but in their planning as well, so symmetry. Found everywhere in Chinese architecture, secondary elements are positioned either side of main structures as wings to maintain the overall balance. Uh, the buildings are typically planned to contain an even number of columns with main doors in the center of the building. And then the buildings, uh, even, if a, even for a, a single family home, uh, in the center there would be a shrine and then going out from there would be living areas and bedrooms, and then they would branch off into these wings. And so you see these, uh, the main structure there at the top branching off from the center and then um, buildings stepping down from that to create this square courtyard area. We're gonna talk more about that in a second. So the symmetry uh, repeated within buildings and within courtyards and with larger compounds as well. This is something called a sky well. And so is this. Uh, what it is, is it's like a mini courtyard within a building. So if a uh, series of rooms were interconnected in that symmetrical fashion, they might leave an opening through the roof structure so that you could get air and light uh, into the building. Uh, each of these rooms like to have multiple windows and multiple doorway openings that um, would be accessible to sort of the outside. Uh, People of this civilization lived very close to the earth and to nature. And so a lot of their buildings were not designed to shut out the world, uh, though certainly to get out of the weather. But they had um, sliding doors and screens and large openings that allowed them more access to the outside and to blur the line between the inside and the outside somewhat. Also, the interior of their structures were often as open as possible. Uh, large rooms would be shared for multiple purposes, and uh, temporary walls or partitions could be put up for different usages. And this is also why mattresses were often rollable and went on the floor, and why shoes were commonly not worn, because uh, you didn't want to... Um, uh, get a shared space that you had multiple purposes it was used for, you didn't want to get that dirty. Our next keyword is terrace. You can see that each of these buildings is up on a raised platform, but it's not really a wall, it's more like a plateau. And what this was, was they would compound dirt and pack it and compress it and make a mound that they would build the foundation of their buildings on top of. This wasn't every building, but it was uh, impressive or important buildings. And then these would be faced in stone. And it serves a couple of purposes. It made the building look more impressive. It also gave you more of a view out from the building and it allowed the building to get more air in the hot months. Here's a very, very elaborate terraced structure. Um, we're gonna be talking a lot more about the buildings, but just look at the terrace for a moment. And that's the, the platform that the building is on. You can see down on the, uh, on the right down here, if you can see my mouse cursor, there's a, a lovely walkway that's probably going to be out over a view when they finish this construction project. Um, but all of these stepped 
uh, plateaus give a sort of a park or porch feeling to these areas. So this was a place where you could be outside and still be um, uh, within your within your your world of influence. And our next keyword here is going to be courtyards. And courtyards were the inevitable result of the symmetrical building style and creating wings branching off of the main structure. But they also were another way that nature was allowed an organized presence within the family life because you could, again, in this area as well, be outside and still be uh, within a walled compound for safety, security, and um, just for mutual presence. Early on, as I said, that many of the, the simpler dwellings had pits and subterranean sections, and that continued with some of the courtyards. Uh, this is a very ancient uh, sunken courtyard. You can see doorways and uh, arches branching off of it that would lead to uh, further structures. But uh, you can also see the ground level up here on the top left is all the way up there. And so this entire pit is a, is a sunken uh, series of structures. So here is a little diagram of a, um, a family dwelling, a moderate to middle class uh, family dwelling. Um, the main hall was reserved for the eldest of the family, such as the grandparents. Open courtyard lets in the sunlight. The number of buildings and structures around it would be related to the number of family members that you had and needed to house, like the elderly grandparents who would stay with the family. And it also was related to the amount of opulence or the amount of status that your family contained. So you would continue to build out and build on as you were able to. Walls were very important to the Chinese, not just for security, but they had a real psychological sense of um, wanting to feel as if uh, everything was contained. And uh, being inside them, even so much so that they brought nature inside so they could feel like they were protected and then they could also be outside. Here's another simple courtyard. And you can see that the uh, main structure continues all the way around this, but um, asymmetrical natural elements placed within the orderly fashion of the rectangular courtyard was uh, very common. Here's another larger courtyard. This is more like one of those previous diagrams where we can see that um, multiple major buildings or dwellings are interconnected with both porches and terraces and uh, open hallways through, the, through the, the outside of the structure. Here's a smaller, more, uh, more intimate courtyard. Eaves. Eaves are, in every culture, uh, just the part of the roof that sticks out past the wall, which you might have heard called the overhang. And this is going to come up again a lot as we go forward for, for the rest of the class. But um, in particular, uh, Asian eaves were much, much larger. So their overhang would be a lot more. One of the reasons was because they really prized having as much as possible be made out of wood, they wanted to protect the wooden paneled walls from the snow and the rain. And so they developed these techniques for their roofs to stick out even further. And that led to some very unique roof structures that uh, indicate to us right away when we see an image like this that it feels Asian. Here are eaves on something called the Red Gate. Uh, one of the most recognizable features of Asian architecture is the complexity of the roof structures, and we're gonna talk more about that in a second. The Pagoda. A pagoda is a tiered tower with multiple decorative eaves, frequently used as a temple and renowned for uh, spectacular views. So uh, these might have been monasteries, they might have been temples, uh, there are thousands and thousands of them across China and Japan. And uh, here you can see the multiple roof structures and the elaborate eave decorations. And you can see the um, balconies that would result. And so the people, you can go there even today and visit and stand up there and see for miles. Here's two more pagodas. I believe both of these are in Japan. Japan drew a lot of its influence from China, as I said before, and then went on to develop their own style. As you can see, these feel a little bit lighter, maybe a little bit more uh, open space and neutrality of, of uh, material usage. Pagodas. And so I mentioned these before, the roof tiles 
tiles are one of our keywords. Uh, the use of clay uh, to make ceramic tiles was an incredible invention for the Chinese because these roof tiles, unless they are crushed by some tree falling on them or whatever have you, they will last forever. Uh, they don't lose their color. They don't deteriorate. Uh, they may need to be uh, re-mortared at some point, but uh, that's just a maintenance thing. So the roof tiles are ubiquitous throughout Chinese civilization. They could be in any color, and it gives a lot of boldness and um, intensity to the look of all of these buildings. Yellow roof tiles were reserved specifically for the emperor and imperial buildings. So if you see that, you know that you're looking at an, an imperial building. But many of them were very, very decorative. You can see all the sculptures here, and also even the ends of the tiles were, were stamped. And because they were made out of clay, you see something similar to what we saw in the Mesopotamian civilizations, the ability to create these low reliefs that were very decorative. Because of their fascination with woodworking, the Chinese and subsequently the Japanese developed uh, over thousands of years an incredible sense of woodworking craftsmanship. And one of the most impressive things is called joinery. That's just joining two pieces of wood together, but it's done so without using any nails or bolts or screws or frequently glue either to put things together. And the way that you do that is by very carefully uh, making the shapes of the pieces fit perfectly together. We saw this in the stonework of the Inca civilization, but for the Chinese and the Japanese, the mastery of wood joinery um, led to uh, incredibly beautiful works of art that had a major influence on Western civilization and architecture that we'll talk about when we get up to the late 19th century and the arts and crafts movement. So here you can see on the left two pieces of wood that have been very carefully cut by hand to go together perfectly. And on the right, you can see how perfectly they go together. This may look like inlay, but in actuality, it's not just a very thin surface layer. It is a uh, full bit of structure that is actually doing the fastening of these pieces together. Hip and gable roofs. That may be a strange term to you, but you see these types of roofs all the time, and it's an incredibly common architectural term. And quite simply, a gable roof is, is uh, an A roof. When you see the side of a building and the roof just ends, it may stick out with an eave, but uh, in this picture where you see the white, that's a gable, it's the end of a roof. But a roof that doesn't end, that goes around the corner, is called a hip roof. A hip roof is where each wall has a roof bit that slopes up towards a center. And uh, very common in Asian architecture is that a building might have both. Something that makes something feel really Asian is to have both a hip roof like this and a gabled piece like this. So this structure has both hip roofs and gabled sections. And all of this is uh, eaves that stick out past the walls. Here's another good view of uh, hip roofs with a tiny little gable section on this part and here. And here's a massive gable that's sticking out from this temple. Gardens. So as I said before, the, uh, the ancient Chinese and subsequently the other Asian civilizations that they influenced, they really loved to create a space that was delineated by walls that they had complete control over. That having been said, they also really loved nature, but they liked it in an organized fashion but not too organized. And so they would have uh, massive asymmetrical um, gardens that featured zigzagging pathways and ponds and rock sculptures and trees and flowers. And they would have halls and pavilions out in the middle of these gardens, as you see here, to hold ceremonies or events. And so this would be something that was very manicured, but also each individual element would be allowed to be asymmetrical and amorphous in a certain way because they considered that to be very beautiful. Here's several gardens that you can see here, uh, rock pathways, lots of use of water and natural materials to traverse that water and to be near it without being in it. Uh, but an incredible passion for um, flowering plants and nature in general. Here, this is a Japanese garden. You can see uh, a little bit more use of openness and negative space and um, 
a little bit fewer elements overall. But a lot of places to stand and to be and to observe. Uh, one thing that I read said that a, walking through a Japanese garden was like going through a series of places to look out on what looks like a painting, like a natural painting. In Japanese gardens a lot, you're also going to see uh, heavy, heavy influence from uh, ideas of from Buddhism and from uh, Zen practice. So Zen gardens, often you will see uh, sand raked into elaborate continuous patterns. And the practice of this is part of a, a meditational practice. Lacquer. Lacquer is a super important word because it's one of the things that when uh, Chinese and Japanese civilization became incredibly interesting to people in the West, that it's one of the things that we imported and copied the most. And what lacquer is, it's a hard, glossy coating made from, typically made from tree sap, although you can make it out of many things and there are synthetic lacquers now. But they used it to coat a huge array of objects, including furniture, dishes, um, typically black or red, and offering, often featuring sections uh, with stone or other inlay. So this is a panel. Uh, Japanese screens and Chinese screens were an incredibly popular import to the West. And uh, this one is black lacquer with gold. Everyday items would be lacquered as well. This uh, teapot, as well as this small tray, are both lacquered, the tray being lacquered with a something that looks like gold with some uh, brush painting on it. Silk, made from carefully unwinding the cocoons of the silkworm and spinning into threads that become fabric. Silk is a strong, durable, soft, and elegant fabric used by predominantly upper-class people, but then going forward in time, more people had access to it. Um, and so, yes, they grow these silkworms and they feed them and uh, the silkworms will spin into cocoons. And the cocoons are then uh, unrolled and harvested and spun into threads and then they weave silk garments out of the threads. Very fascinating. Here are some finished silk fabrics with geometric patterns on them. And here are some silk garments being worn uh, the, on the right, uh, what I believe is a Chinese wedding dress. And then on the left, uh, these people, I believe, are Japanese and uh, she's wearing kimono. So from the beginning, as we've seen in other civilizations, um, early skirts of various types led to more elaborate robes and the, the development of sleeves and then subsequently into uh, the development of pants as well. Uh, many shawls and wraps and tunics were developed. Uh, the poorest people at the beginning wore hemp and um, other natural fibers that were cheap. And they also had linen, like the Egyptians, which, as you remember, is spun from flax. But at the higher end, they wore silk, and that was developed as well. One of the things that makes it really challenging to dig into uh, the entire history of Chinese and Japanese clothing styles is that unlike what we have had in the West, um, both architecture and fashion, where we have huge swings in the shape and style of what we are making uh, related to radical shifts in culture and politics, uh, changes that happened where civilizations would rise and fall. In China and its uh, influenced territories, they basically developed the same things over and over and over again with small variations continuously for thousands of years. They didn't have they had quite a few major historical events, but uh, their developments of architecture and fashion did not experience vast interruptions uh, as, those, as, as happened in the West. And so uh, there's so many iterations that are similar. If you look here at the middle picture, it says 960 to 1279 AD, and the picture on the right, 220 to 420 AD. And uh, from my mind, in the beginning, it would be hard to discern uh, vast differences in these shapes. Um, so I think it is a bit challenging to dig into the specifics of the fashion developments of the Chinese. Here's a picture of a wedding ceremony taking place. You can see the use of silk both in the costuming and in the, the walled panels 
around them. You can see some nice joinery and lacquer in this image as well. But what we do see is a lot of wrapped layers of robing with loose sleeves and sashes and belts, very decorative embroidery and uh, very meticulous sewing patterns that led to um, quite realistic animal imagery and uh, animals often in their environment. So birds on branches or swans by reeds or whatever have you. Um, lots of environments in situ, so to speak. Uh, very fascinating wooden shoes that you can see here during the very fascinating wooden shoes that you can see here during certain periods. Here we can see a very early emperor on the right in a painting and on the left this picture is from the 50s. Here again we see uh, crossed lapels with an open collar and sleeves and a sash uh, or belt to cinch the waist. One of the key elements to determine time period was the relative blockiness of the clothing. So there are uh, dynasties where you would see uh, baggy or blocky clothing like this, almost reminiscent to me of what you would see in early Russian structures. And I think the only way to really delve into this would be to take the specific project that you might be working on and do very specific research on the relevant time period because um, to get all of this right, you would need to compile quite a bit of research and compare it to the, the content that you're working on. Uh, there's also a vast array of artwork from the time period of both of these civilizations, from brush painting to calligraphy uh, to woodblock printing that is uh, very, very beautiful and incredible to witness. So here are our keywords for ancient China and Japan, and I tried to move them over a little bit so that you could see them all. But uh, symmetry, buildings and compounds would be the same on each side of center. Terrace, a raised platform of compounded earth faced in stone to raise a building up and make it impressive. Courtyards enclosed entire properties or sections within walls. Eaves, uh, in all cultures, the edge of a roof that overhangs a wall. Pagoda, a multi-tiered tower with multiple decorative eaves frequently used as temples. Tiles, glazed ceramic tiles for roofing that last hundreds of years without deteriorating. Joinery, fastening wooden beams and planks with interlocking joints instead of nails. Hip and gable roofs. A gable is an open-ended roof with an A shape. Uh, a hip is a roof that slopes in equally from all sides. Gardens. Enclosed by walls and including one or more ponds, rockwork, trees, and flowers connected by winding paths. Lacquer. A hard, glossy coating made from tree sap used to coat a huge array of objects, including furniture and dishes. And finally, silk, strong, soft fabric made from the cocoons of silkworms. So those are our major concepts for this, and I would strongly encourage you to do some further reading because every lecture that we have, every single keyword, every single sentence could be expanded out into a degree program, much less a single class. And so... Um, all of this, I hope, just piques an interest that would allow you to do the amount of research that would be justified in learning about and studying each of these topics. So thanks for being here in this lecture, and feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Thank you very much.